Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video series where we talk a lot about so-called Fourier series. And indeed in today's part 22 we will tackle the famous Riemann-Lebesgue lemma. Roughly speaking, this one tells us that the Fourier coefficients form a sequence which is convergent with limit 0. However, before we formulate this theorem, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And as a reminder, a Steady membership gives you access to a lot of additional material like PDF versions, early access and quizzes. So please use the link in the description to download the additional material. So let's start by recalling that we have defined the Fourier series in L1. This was not a problem at all because the Fourier coefficients given by this integral exist for any L1 function f. And moreover we also have introduced a new name for the Fourier coefficients, namely we call them f hat of k. Which immediately implies that we get a whole sequence of complex numbers here. And now a natural question we could ask is, what can we say about this sequence of complex numbers? And one famous answer for that question is the so-called Riemann-Lebesgue lemma. For historical reasons it's still called a lemma, but nevertheless it's a really important result in the theory of Fourier series. And it tells us that for any L1 function the sequence of Fourier coefficients is a convergent sequence for k to plus or minus infinity. More precisely we can write that this limit exists and is equal to zero. So eventually measured with the absolute value the sequence becomes smaller and smaller. So we cannot say how fast it goes to zero but at least we know it goes to zero. This means the linear map we have denoted by a hat goes from L1 into the space of convergent sequences with limit zero. And the common notation for this space is simply c with index zero. So not a complicated space and now we know by the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma that all the sequences given by Fourier coefficients lie inside that space. However, what we definitely don't know is if this map here is also subjective. And at this point I can already tell you that we don't have that, so this hat map will not hit all the sequences tending to zero on the right hand side. Hence not every sequence here is given by the Fourier coefficients of an L1 function. However this is not a topic for today, because today we will just prove that the hat map maps into this sequence space. For the proof of that you should first note that we already know it for L2 functions. This is quite clear, because for the space of square integrable functions we have Parseval's identity. And this one tells us that the corresponding sequence of Fourier coefficients is square summable. And by using the mathematical language we would just write this sequence is an element of small l2. And obviously tending to zero at infinity is necessary for a sequence being square summable. Or in other words l2 is a proper subset of c0. In other words this result is not new for us at all if we just consider L2 functions. However if we take a function which is in L1 but not in L2 we don't know anything yet. So for example the graph of such a problematic function could look like this. It could explode somewhere so it does not have to be bounded at all. The only requirement we need is that the integral of the absolute value is still a finite number. Hence in this picture we would say that this area that stretches to infinity still has a finite value. But we cannot assume that the same thing holds when we have the absolute value of f squared. There it could definitely happen that the value of the area is infinity. And this is exactly the case we need to address now. And there the simple idea is to make the function square integrable by making it bounded. In other words, we just cut the function at the top. And of course this nice picture is correct for any function when we say the graph is of the absolute value of f. Then everything here is non-negative and we just have to cut at the top. However this new cut function should still be a complex valued one, so let's call it fn. It's a 2 pi periodic function, so we can define it on the whole real number line. And actually the definition is already given in the picture, we just distinguish two cases. 
if the absolute value of f at a given point x is less than our given n, then we don't want to do anything, we should still have the same value f of x. On the other hand, in the case that we are larger than this given n, then we want to cut the function. And then to make it simple, we just set it to the given value n. And obviously this definition works for any fixed natural number capital N. And now the good thing is, with this bounded fn, we are back in our best case, we are in L2. So for this cut version of the function, we can use Parseval's identity again. Indeed, this is the whole idea, and then we just have to build the bridge back to our original function f. And for that we can use a nice convergence result, which is known as Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. This is a theorem about integration, and I have discussed it in my measure theory series. So if you are interested in the proof, you can check it out there, but here we just want to apply it. Therefore I first tell you the assumptions we need, and then the implication. As the name suggests, we need a dominating function, and this one can be our original function f. Indeed this inequality is quite clear, because this is how we have defined the cut version of the function. And to be precise, we need this inequality for every n in n, and for every x in r almost everywhere. Almost everywhere makes sense, because we only talk about the equivalence classes of function here anyway. And on the other hand, we also want to have pointwise convergence for this sequence of functions. This means when n tends to infinity, then this should tend to f of x. Also this assumption should hold almost everywhere, and it's not hard to see that we have that indeed. If we increase n, then we cut less and less of the original function. Therefore for a fixed point x here, eventually this convergence will happen. And now Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem says, if you have these two assumptions, then we also have convergence of the sequence to f with respect to the L1 norm. Or to say it in other words, we also have the convergence of the integral. So inside the integral we have the difference between fn and f. And even after integrating that, it still goes to zero when n tends to infinity. And exactly this is the result of Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. It just gives us the justification to push the limit into the integration. And of course the question for us is now, can we use it for the Fourier coefficients? The basic idea would be to use the Fourier coefficients of our L2 function fn. And then by increasing the natural number n, we should approximate our Fourier coefficient of f better and better. So how can we see that? Maybe first we use the definition of the Fourier coefficient. So here we would have the difference between two integrations, but we can also put it together. Which means we have fn of x minus f of x times the exponential function. And now since we only care about the difference of the two complex numbers on the left, we can also consider the absolute value on both sides. And by having that, we can use the triangle inequality for the integration. Which simply means that we can push the absolute value into the integration. And there please recall, the modulus of the complex exponential function in this form is equal to 1. So the only thing that remains inside is the distance between fn of x and f of x. And there we already know that we can make this as small as we want, just by increasing n. Moreover, we also recognize that this does not depend on the chosen k on the left hand side. So the conclusion is that all the Fourier coefficients of f can be approximated by the Fourier coefficients of fn. And with that we almost have it, we just have to put everything together. To be clear, now we have two different kinds of convergence we can combine. Maybe let's first write down the second one, because we just have discussed it. It means for any given epsilon, we find an index capital N, such that the right hand side here is smaller than epsilon. Which also implies that the left hand side is smaller than epsilon for any given k. And now if we want, we can also make it less than epsilon half. Okay, so this should be clear, because it's exactly what came out of Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. 
And now on the other hand, the first convergence we have already discussed at the beginning of the proof. It's just that every fn function lies in L2, so they all satisfy Parseval's identity. Which implies that after an index capital K, all the sequence members lie inside an epsilon ball. And this is true in both directions, so it holds for plus infinity and minus infinity. Hence we can just write that the absolute value of k is greater or equal than the given capital K. And now being inside the epsilon ball means that the modulus of the complex number is less than epsilon. And also here we can choose the radius of the ball as epsilon half as well. Very well, both statements here are correct and we can combine them to get our result. Which means if you give me an epsilon greater than zero, I can choose a capital N and a capital K. More precisely, first we choose the capital N according to the second statement and then according to epsilon and N we can choose the capital K according to the first statement. Afterwards we can combine both statements again and get something out for integers k. But of course the first statement gives us the requirement that the absolute value of k is greater or equal than capital K. And now for all these integers k we want to show that the absolute value of the Fourier coefficient of f is less than our given epsilon. Because exactly this would be the convergence to zero for k to plus or minus infinity. And with that we almost have it, we just have to introduce our fn into the equation again. So we subtract and add the Fourier coefficient fn hat. And then we can simply use the triangle inequality. And then you might already see it, we have exactly the two parts where we have an estimate. And that's the whole reason why we chose epsilon half before. So the modulus of this Fourier coefficient here is less than epsilon and this holds for infinitely many indices after a starting index. In other words we can make it arbitrarily small eventually and this is exactly the convergence we wanted to show. And with that the riemann lebesgue lemma is proven. Please note here we have shown it for the complex Fourier coefficients but of course it also holds for the real ones. This just follows from the standard relation between the two representations of the Fourier series. Therefore the riemann lebesgue lemma might also help you if you have an integral with a cosine or sine function involved. Ok, with that I close this video and I really hope I meet you next time. Bye bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.